Centrifuge YouTube channel, hopefully tonight. Okay, so we've got people in the crowd now. Um, let's just kick off. So we have Leah and Lucas here from Centrifuge. And Leah, would you like to just quickly introduce our other, other two panelists? Sure. Um, okay, so everyone's familiar with Lucas. Um, we have um, Seth and Will join us from the maker real world finance core unit. They have been seeing our face a lot lately in the last few months. Um, we have been working with both of them to um, mostly on the risk evaluation, the due diligence for the different asset originators that we're navigating through the maker governance process. And yeah, Seb is going to give a short run through of the new silver um, due diligence. And yeah, it's going to give a short presentation on that later on. Perfect. Thank you, Leah. So to kick us off in this AMA, we are going to start with a little bit of content. Um, and yeah, I would like to ask you to start. Where's this um, all come from? This is a, a huge development in DeFi. Um, tell us a bit about it. Cool. Yeah, I actually thought I'm going to start with a tiny recap or like overview of what the what maker is, what centrifuge does, because I think we have a little bit of a mix of community, some that are more familiar with maker, some more familiar with centrifuge. So in really short, um, this we're actually super excited that we're finally are able to host this session because this has been the longest partnership in the making. We have been working on this for almost two years. So super excited that we're finally at this point. Um, Maker is, I guess, the OG of DeFi. So it's the biggest liquidity protocol in DeFi with around 3.6 billion of DAI in circulation. And the way it works is that uh, anyone, basically any DeFi participant can lock up um, collateral in a maker vault to issue or mint new DAI. Um, after a multi-collateral DAI um, launched, um, the collateral types that are allowed in maker vaults expanded from only ETH to several other collateral tokens, um, which are ultimately, they run through a certain governance process and then are accepted by the DAO to be added to the collateral portfolio. Then Centrifuge, on the other hand, we also work with a range of collateral, but a tiny bit differently. So um, we actually work with several asset originators that um, um, we enable to tokenize their financial assets, like bring their assets on chain, and then uh, finance them via Tin Lake using crypto liquidity, so tap into DeFi liquidity. And around two years ago, we started thinking about, okay, how can we enable the asset originators, um, or like how can we enable those assets not only to be financed by having um, individual or institutional investors um, deposit die into a Tim Lake pool and then allow the asset originator to, to use that die and finance alone. How can we actually make it possible to directly interact with the origin of die? Like how can we enable the asset originators to directly connect to the protocol and mint their own die basically. And I circled here New Silver because um, this is actually what happened in the last few weeks. Um, New Silver is the first asset originator um, that we've worked with that has been using the centrifuge infrastructure and now got approved by maker governance and is now able to mint their own die. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, cool. So this is also a super simplified flow of how it works. Um, this is a general overview, but for new silver, that would mean now that um, they can um, use Centrifuge to tokenize their mortgages, um, deposit them in a tin lake loan, then um, and then actually use the collateral tokens that we have on tin lake. So we have this 
senior token, the drop token, and the junior token, the tin token, um, then use this collateral token, in this case, the senior one, to um, directly deposit into a maker vault and mint new die, and then use this die to finance a loan. And um, for um, new silver, they got approved by the community with a first or initial debt ceiling of 5 million. Um, and that means that, um, yeah, new silver can use up this, you can look at the credit, like this uh, debt ceiling similar to as um, a credit line. So um, as they originate more loans, they can draw from that credit line. And here, this is a tiny screenshot. I hope it's not too small. Um, that happened yesterday. And we, or I think Kirill is also on this call. Kirill actually uh, from New Silver, he minted um, his own die for the first time yesterday. You can see here, there is the 30, um, 35,000 die. He actually originated a loan of um, around 180K. There was still a little bit of funds in the reserve from other investors that deposited die into the pool. And um, so the reserve was first used up and then the remainder tapped into the maker vault. And here you can also see they got a um, debt ceiling of 5 million. And yeah, this is, this is basically the start of, of this whole collaboration. And this is it in really, really short. Um, Seb will give all the detail of what the parameters are, what, how new server is structured, et cetera. Um, but this is the, the short gist and maybe I can hand over to Lucas and so you can put it more in a, in a bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, why, why real world assets in Maker and like why real world assets in DeFi um, is of course like a question we always ask ourselves, well, like it seems like a very, it seems like maybe like a very big and daunting task to bring these things that have a lot of legacy, a lot of legal and other challenges around it and try to like make marry that with the with the crypto world. But it actually is a huge opportunity because bringing real world assets into DeFi, I think has two effects on it. First of all, these real businesses are able to start to benefit from this eco this financial system that we're trying to build. So we're like giving giving something to the to them an alternative to the financial system that they have to use today. And I think something, a financial system that is fundamentally better. And um, ultimately, of course, we want as many users as possible to use that system. Um, but I think very important for Maker uh, and DeFi as a whole is not just that, not just that part, but also it makes our whole system more robust. Crypto today is obviously very intertwined, very correlated. And um, so as a system, we don't have a lot of um, diversity and assets that are uncorrelated. That means in a, in a crash, in, in like a, uh, when crypto is not doing well, um, it's, it affects everything. Adding real world assets to this ecosystem actually fixes that problem as well, because now we have uncorrelated assets and we really have uh, stability and safety in something that um, today you can only use to have, be like, extremely exposed to crypto and sort of this interplay, I think is where, um, it really now can make DeFi go mainstream, both for investors and borrowers to use it as a system that they can actually use to just completely get rid of banks. Um, and that's, I think what we're, what we're excited about, um, makers, I think the project that is the most advanced in sort of thinking, um, how to expand DeFi and bring it to more people. It was at the very core of the vision from a very early point. And so I think sort of in, in that, you can see that they're now also the first ones actually to, to ship um, as a first major protocol to ship and sort of bring real world assets in. Um, but I think all of DeFi will follow um, because there are, uh, as, as uh, Frank said in the chat, there are trillion, billions and trillions of assets out there that we can start making this world um, useful for. Great, thanks, Lucas. So now um, we'll hand to Seb to give a lot more of the details, as Leah says, um, some of the, the 
parameters. And of course, we've only got 15 minutes for this section, so we won't be able to cover every last detail. But Seb, take it away. I, you can share, perfect. And then audience, we will uh, be starting to answer all of your great questions um, when Seb finishes. Yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to present uh, the vision of uh, MakerDAO uh, onboarding new silver in the multi-collateral die system. Uh, I will touch briefly, just to keep some time, uh, plenty of time for the questions. So feel free to ask any question or ask more details later on. Uh, just to briefly present the agenda, we will start with uh, digging a little bit more on what is MakerDAO and why we want to invest in, uh, in uh, or using work capital to invest in the DWAP token as uh, some of you are. Uh, we will also show how we are investing in the new silver pool, the technical side, a little bit of it, uh, without going too much in detail, but a little bit. Uh, touching a little bit on the liquidations, because it is a, this is a super important for us and to see how it works. As uh, a processes, so how it will work and how it starts already to work because uh, as uh, Lea said, uh, we have minted our first die uh, yesterday. Uh, a bit on the legal side, the SPVs, the monitoring, and uh, maybe touch briefly on the real estate crisis of subprimes, just to see that why we want to invest in drop token is because there's a lot of safety, thanks to the structuring, uh, uh, so the, the senior position of the drop token, and what will change or most likely not change for the drop investors. So uh, MakerDAO is a decentralized bank of DeFi. It's like uh, any bank. Uh, we mint and lend the DAI, which is a stable coin. Uh, again, good collateral. And good collateral usually is uh, some uh, crypto assets, uh, but uh, can also be, and soon will be, or is it since uh, yesterday, some real uh, real estate properties in the real world. And that's uh, quite amazing. So we have more than 3 million DAI outstanding. We are making uh, more than $1 million of revenue annually. And we are looking to diversify equalities. Uh, why that is because uh, as you can see on the, but on the chart uh, on the bottom of the page, uh, we have, well, assets are increasing. The assets are more or less so the amount of DAI in circulation, so people are uh, very happy to hold the DAI and to use DAI interactions. But we have so many people that want to hold the DAI that we don't find enough crypto collateral to mint those DAI. So we have what we call in this slide the trading assets, which are more or less other stable coins that don't bring first, don't bring any money to the protocol. And the more money we earn, the more we can invest in the safety of the, of the protocol and the growth of the protocol. And the, the stablecoin has have another issue that's uh, more or less centralized. Uh, some entity can decide to, uh, to blacklist uh, some of our account. Uh, so that's a good opportunity to diversify collaterals and not having correlation with the crypto asset as well. And obviously, if we can invest more on, uh, on assets that are yielding, uh, creating value, we can uh, push this value to die holders because we have what we call the DSR, uh, which might be integrated in the lake pool as well. So the reserve you put on the lake earn already much, some, uh, some money. Uh, investing in the, silver, in the new silver pool, uh, so those are fixed and flip loans in the US. It was a long process. It started the MIP6 submission, which is not the start. The start was a bit earlier, but uh, the MIP6 submission was in July 2020, and the onboarding was, uh, well, uh, last week. Uh, the pool is already big. There are already uh, 16 uh, underlying loans. And uh, as Leah said, we have fixed the debt ceiling currently at 5 million. And that's the idea is that's a start. And we can grow this uh, debt ceiling as needed in the future to to accompany the growth of uh, New Silver, and we will be happy to. Just to brief, uh, to touch briefly on the technical side. So on the top of the chart, you have what should already be known by uh, centrifuge investors, is that the asset originator, in this case, New Silver, is bringing assets and tokenizing them into the Tin Lake pool. 
and the team Lake pool provide opportunities for investors, the team tranche, which is the junior tranche, the more risky one, and the drop tranche, which is, which is the more secure one. So investor can, can invest into the, those tokens. In our case, we are go, going through two MIPs, so two smart contracts. Uh, the first one is MIP22, which was developed by Centrifuge, uh, which allowed Tinlake to speak with uh, MIP22 and put some uh, drop token as collateral in MIP22. Using this uh, drop token, MIP22 will speak with MIP21, which will itself mint some DAI uh, because we know that the, the collateral ratio, the amount, the value of the drop token inside MIP22 will always be higher than the loan generated in DAI. Uh, speaking about liquidation, so usually we make uh, crypto loans, meaning that you bring, for instance, uh, one uh, wrapped Bitcoin to the to a system, and we give you, let's say, uh, one thousand dollars, one thousand DAI, and you need to repay with an interest uh, in the future when you want. Uh, the issue is if the price of wrapped Bitcoin fall sharply, uh, you might be not incentivized to repay at any time soon. So what happens usually is that if the price of a wrap Bitcoin, in this case, drop too much, we will sell the wrap Bitcoin, get the money back, give the remaining part of the value to the vault holder and use the rest to, to repay the loan. So the, the borrower doesn't have to repay the loan, but he's no longer have the, the collateral. Obviously, in the real world, it's a bit more difficult. You cannot sell properties on the, on the, on Uniswap or on other exchanges. So, um, liquidation in our case is triggered by governance, uh, which is, uh, which are the MKR token holders. And we are triggering it when the covenants are breached. We will see later what are those covenants, but mainly we need to ensure that the value of the drop token is still the value of the collateral inside the drop token is uh, enough. Or when MakerDAO wants to stop the investment, most likely in the long future, at some point we might want to stop the investment for any reason. And what is the liquidation in the centrifuge and uh, specifically the new silver case? Is like any other investors, when you buy some drop tokens, we can ask to be redeemed, to get DAI from those drop tokens. And it will be exactly the same for makers. There is no difference. We will, when we will liquidate, we just bring all those drop tokens to the smart contract to Tinlake and say, okay, when there is some cash flows or if there are some reserves, we want to be repaid from the drop and close uh, the, the deal. Obviously, the Tinlake pool will not have all the cash uh, on hand and uh, the portfolio and the underlying loans we have to mature. Uh, on New Silver, it's a uh, loan of uh, up to uh, 24 months, but on average, uh, 12 months. So it will take a bit more than a year to, to get all the money back. And what is important to note is that maker liquidation doesn't impact other drop investors. Uh, it's just exactly the same rights that all, any other uh, drop investor. Uh, just to show you a little bit how it will work, uh, usually, you have some die reserves inside the tin lake. Uh, so let's say that uh, there is a half a million of die reserves in the tin lake, uh, which is more or less the case uh, when New Silver was uh, before minting asset number uh, 15. Then they mint the NFT for the asset uh, 15, and they took invested in a loan using the cash from the tin lake. But there was still enough cash to pay for the loan and still having some more reserves. So no money was taken for the revolving credit facility of Maker. Then there was uh, the asset 16, which was done uh, yesterday. And in that case, there was not enough die in the reserve of the Tin Lake. So they took take a loan, took a loan uh, from, uh, from Maker. And uh, we are currently here. Uh, some die were taken from Maker and maintained with Maker. Let's say someone 
another co-investor or someone is investing again in the drop token, what will happen is that uh, with the die from this new investor, um, the chinlake pool will repay the maker loan. And obviously, if uh, the chinlake is new silver is making a new loan, uh, the chinlake will uh, mint more die from maker, and so on. Uh, speaking briefly about the legal side, uh, as you might know, uh, there is a distinction between new silver, the asset originator, and the SPV that is holding all those assets for the drop and team investors, which is called uh, NS Pool LLC. Uh, the idea is to have a bankruptcy remoteness. And uh, on our side, what we have done as well, using uh, uh, for our core unit, the real world finance uh, core unit, is we have signed and invested in a drop token, in some drop token. And this was important to, to be sure that we can uh, exercise the right of uh, the drop subscription. And we also have uh, signed a side letter to formalize some audit right for the reward finance core unit. So we will have uh, some discussion with uh, New Silver to, to see that everything is in line with the covenant that I promised to discuss a bit uh, later. Uh, we are also in the process of adding uh, an independent director from uh, Citadel SP, which will increase the bankruptcy remoteness and deal with an issue if uh, one should arise. Uh, as said, we are monitoring uh, the, the SPV. Uh, we are not managing at all the SPV, we are just monitoring that some covenants are respected, that we have uh, decided with the new silver at uh, doing the onboarding. Uh, the most important one, and the one we care much about, is that the value of the asset of, sorry about that, uh, the value of the asset of the SPV should be uh, significantly above the value of all the drop token. Uh, in uh, centrifuge speaking, it's the chin ratio. Uh, in TINEG, the chin ratio for new silver should be, if I'm not mistaken, uh, always above 15%. If the chin ratio goes below 15%, it will no longer possible for uh, new silver to issue new loan. They have to they have to uh, put more tin, more equity in the in the SPV, in the tin egg pool, uh, and we have a target to be always above one or eight percent, and uh, it's not, it shouldn't be uh, easy to get below that threshold because it would mean that one or two properties will be uh, completely uh, defaulted. So we have uh, quite a buffer before uh, doing any liquidation because we are in uh, the investment for the long run. And there are other, uh, other covenants but are not super important. We are always checking that new silver is invested in the tin token and we are making some due diligence on both the centrifuge and, uh, and new silver. Uh, well, briefly, uh, what we are investing in the senior tranche is like investing in the triple A tranche of residential mortgage backed securities uh, that were given the last financial crisis. So some people can say, oh, it's super risky, but actually it's not uh, because we are not investing in the more uh, risky ones. We are all investing in the drop tranche, which is the safest one. And if you just take the same uh, analogy with the subprime crisis, uh, the drop token at the time, which were called uh, the triple A tranche, uh, were losing only up to 2% with the subprime crisis. So we are quite safe that uh, it, will, uh, it will work quite the same if there is a big, uh, big crisis. And finally, uh, I want to touch briefly on uh, what change for centrifuge users, the drop investors. Uh, I think is, uh, there is three points uh, to note. One is that uh, credit, the revolving credit facility will provide more liquidity to drop investors. Currently, if the reserve is uh, depleted, you have to wait for the assets inside the teenage pool to mature, to get the money back and uh, redeem your drop token. With the revolving credit facility, the cool thing is that you don't have to wait because 
the teenage pool will be able to draw a loan on Maker and regime as a drop token for, for the drop investors. So they bring a quick liquidity on the drop token. Another cool feature is that uh, all drop investors will enjoy the third party audits uh, because obviously uh, we have spent a lot of time uh, on board, uh, making an onboarding due diligence with uh, New Silver. So we have spent uh, a lot of time uh, to see that everything is, uh, is good and safe. So that's, that doesn't change anything to you, but uh, it's always good to know that uh, a third party has looked and didn't see anything uh, shady or, or not expected. And we will also provide a continuous monitoring. So that means that it's also safer for, for everyone. And uh, the last point, which is uh, cool as well, is uh, the, the pool size will uh, be able to be bigger. And in investments, the bigger is the more safer. For any simple reasons, if that the chin lake grow a lot, there will be plenty of uh, we can, it would be possible to spare a little bit of money to add more securities to the teammate pool and secure everyone in the process. Uh, one example is uh, an economic director that uh, we will be will be onboarded uh, soon. So yes, that was uh, about it. And if you want me to dig a little bit deeper in some details, happy to answer any question. Great, thank you so much, Seb. Um, so if you can stop sharing your screen and then we'll see yep. all the panelists' faces. Um, so we'll begin our question time um, and let's give some priority to the questions coming in from the people in the, in the room. Um, so we'll start there and then we'll, we'll go to some of the ones that have come in through Twitter and the forum. And I invite all of you to just, if you want to add something to someone else's answer, please feel free to do so. Just jump in whenever you want. So first question um, is, well, we just got in from Peyton, um, which is so practically, now that dye has been drawn from the facility that happens within the, the trust or the SPV, and for example, we're able to see withdrawals on websites running APIs, APIs for the meta protocol, does the SPV have any reporting requirements when the credit line is utilized? Who wants to take that one to start off with? Maybe Seb? Uh, so just maybe a two part, I'm not sure I understand correctly. Uh, if the TNIC pool, if New Silver want to make an investment, doesn't have to have any discussion with us directly. Uh, they can just uh, mint the NFT like they did uh, yesterday and they will get the die directly. And some drop token will be generated and issued as collateral uh, for Maker, but it's an automated process and the team they pull does that uh, automatically. Uh, but we are still uh, uh, working with uh, New Silver monthly to check that uh, everything is fine and as expected. Yeah, and you can also see the activity, how much um, um, New Silver has been drawing from the credit line on the Tin Lake dashboard, actually. So if I dropped it in the chat, can you see it? Yeah. Um, there is on one side, so if you are on the overview, you can see the current debt and then the overall debt ceiling. And if you switch to the tap assets, um, then here you can see um, the amounts and maturities, et cetera, of, of the individual loans. And we also have uh, all the maker websites that are showing the, the information. As there is one which is Maker Burn, when you can see the history of the usage of. Uh, of the NS uh, Vault, but it's called uh, Clearwater Asset 0002. That's a bit uh, complicated to find. <laughs> okay, someone just wants to check their understanding. Um, a question came through. Can we think of this like a, a HELOC loan where the user can borrow against the equity of their home to generate die? I'm a bit confused about this. Um, can anyone provide some? 
clarity on that answer. Anyone know what a HALOC loan is? Lucas? So, uh, maybe I'll, I can explain what HELOC is. It's called Home Equity Line of Credit. Um, it's very common in the US. Um, I don't know where else it's common, but basically when you buy a house and you get money from the bank to buy it, this is considered a mortgage. Uh, a home equity line of credit is when you already own a house and you maybe need to spend money on a renovation or maybe just to, maybe it's not a smart idea, smartest idea, but if you wanted to go on a vacation, you could borrow money against your house and then pay back later. Uh, not, not financially very uh, sound advice, but your home equity line of credit is just a line of credit against your house. Um, so new silver assets are not HELOCs. Um, new silver specifically uh, specializes in one area. They, they are what we're calling fix and flip um, renovation projects where it, real estate investors basically come look for uh, distressed properties or like properties that have had uh, a bit of lack of attention. I think they can renovate it and then make it more attractive to future buyers. And uh, so that's what new silver is um, financing. But um, these, these, so the new silver assets, this is real estate that users borrow money against to sell. Uh, the difference to mortgages is that they're much shorter term, um, right? So it's only like one, one to two years. Um, and with the attention that you don't pay it off over time and you live in it, but you actually sell it uh, to a new buyer. Kirill, by the way, from New Silver is also on the call. So yeah, I hope I did that. Right. Yeah, feel Kirill. free to call us out if we're misrepresenting this in any way. Um, yeah, we're going to have a, a, a session with Kirill uh, in one of our community calls. So these more specific questions about home loans and flip and uh, fix and flip, we can answer with Kirill in that community call. But let's panelists jump to um, one of the questions. I'm just putting it in the chat. Um, how does Centrifuge and or Maker decide when and which asset originator will be in a position to be awarded a, a credit line? Is there any limit of finance for a specific AO? And can the sole selection of an asset originator be, be made by Maker? Um, so Leah, do you want to start us off with this one? And we'll I was to actually going to ask Will if he wanted to jump on this. Um, we, of course, um, we work with several different asset originators and like support them through the, the governance process at Maker, but the ones that are then actually deciding the terms and conditions are Will and, and Seb. I mean, ultimately, of course, the governance, but um, maybe Will can actually speak a little bit more to it. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so in terms of the, um, in terms of actually the decision process for the asset originators, what essentially what we, we do beyond the, we have of course the, the, the governments, the green lighting, which is once we've some like the, um, the asset originator has submitted its uh, mid six application uh, for the protocol. And, and there's like community discussions and usually actually there's actually very, very good points that actually are pointed out in there, which actually help a lot in, um, in the way that we actually look at, um, at those debt securities. Um, at the point of deciding priority, we essentially, we are looking at a number of things. Um, within the existing portfolio, what kind of like credit profile that we have from, from, from those different actually originations. We look at the level of exposure. Uh, we look at the, the, the risk, um, the risk reward ratio there, which is more like uh, how much actually, you know, fees that the protocol actually can collect. And, and we look of course, in terms of the portfolio, um, do we want more or less of that asset class in the, the maker portfolio in, in the short or, or long term. So all of those things actually are taken into consideration by the team when we're actually setting kind of the priorities of what comes next. And it's kind of like, it's, it's a little bit like a weighting of all of those parameters. Um, in terms of the limits to financing, we look um, at the, uh, of course, the, 
the quality of the asset originated in itself. So actually the fact that they can perform um, the functions of actually being an asset originator, like through this financials, track record, and so on. And, and we look then at, depending on the kind of like, essentially that that we were talking about here. Um, so say if, um, if it's uh, trade finance um, in this case, or if it's actually more a uh, mortgage, we are gonna be looking at um, the, the risk profile of, uh, of the pool of the, the different borrowers. And therefore, um, how much, like, so for example, like in the case of, um, in the case of new silver, um, are we looking at um, borrowers that actually have like high or low uh, FICO scores? And therefore, how much of that risk we want to extend in terms of exposure to the protocol? Um, yeah, and, that, and, then, and then usually that's kind of like this process and we, and we have quite a bit of actually back and forth uh, within the team. And once the whole risk assessment is done, we then submit uh, the results of the analysis uh, for, the, for the maker protocol holders essentially to vote on our, uh, our recommendations of parameters for the protocol. Okay, very good. And of course, one question that often comes through around these conversations and that is a bit related is what happens when there's a default? um with with a yeah an asset originator you've done all the the deep checks but um who would like to take this one i think i can i can jump in yeah um so there's um several levels of course at which that can occur um a tin lake pool is a set of many different assets right so there's in New Silver's case now, uh, 15, 16 um, properties in there. And these are all different borrowers, right? So New Silver is uh, giving money to different people that are renovating houses and then trying to sell them. And one of them could go uh, could go bankrupt. One of these, or could not, not pay back their loan. And so then the first step that the asset originator will do is they'll, they'll do their best to try to recover um, as much of that asset as possible. Um, and for that, there is a very well-established legal system that we have, right? Like if you don't pay your loan and these are legal contracts that are being signed, um, you can go to court, you can try to seize that property in New Silver's instance. There is something there, right? There's a house, there's a title um, that you can get. And that would then give, then that would sort of go through this liquidation process. Um, but that's not the only, um, that's not sort of the only level of protection. Um, another important part is that we actually are securitizing uh, this portfolio of houses, right? So like when one house goes, when one apple is bad in, in your portfolio of apples, uh, you, you own, you're sort of distributing this entire loss across, in, across the portfolio of investors, but we're doing actually something in addition to that. We, what we're doing is we are um, minting two different types of tokens, we have, which correspond to two different tranches. Um, there's a tin tranche, which is what in traditional finance is often called the equity um, or the junior tranche. Um, this tranche has a higher interest rate, but also takes losses first. So if you think of your portfolio of a million dollars in assets, um, you have $100,000 that come from junior investors uh, that means these $100,000 have higher risk, but also higher return. If the pool loses $50,000 in value, um, your junior investors would lose 50,000 of their 100,000, so a 50% loss. If, the, uh, if there is a loss of 100,000, junior investors would end up having lost their entire investment. And only if it goes above, then you start to have an impact on the senior tranche, which is the stable uh, fixed interest um, tranche that is also collateral within Maker. So um, let's say we have a we have an asset that is performing badly, then you still have this protection. Um, and so what basically you're trying to do, right, is you're trying to price the interest rate right such that the defaults that do happen are less than the interest rate you're able to charge to charge. And sort of against these like single um, single assets that might default you have this junior protection that sort of acts as insurance. Of course, if there's always these black, very rare black swan events where some maybe 
I don't know, the entire coastline of a state gets wiped out by a huge tsunami, um, then that is a, a case that maybe even the junior tranche would not uh, be able to protect against, at which point um, the senior investors would start seeing uh, a, a loss. Um, yeah. Anyone want to add there? I think we actually had Phil joining here. Yes, I'm just yeah. trying to find him in the list. One second. So I'm just going to put through the next question that I think seems like a good one. So while I find Phil, which I can't seem to see him. He raised his hands on the attendees, so maybe. Yeah. OK, so. Just on the question, I'll find Phil, and um, he can come in and comment on this. But we had a question oh. coming through. Oh, there he is. Here we go. Great, Helena Letterman. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, Phil. <laughs> yes. Sorry to be late. Sorry. Um, I don't know if it's helpful because Lucas's explanation was really the important part of it, where um, just generally looking at a Tin Lake pool and how investors participate. But if the question was more about what is the default process at the real estate level? There are a whole bunch of different options and levels involved. Um, but the important point about that is roughly 90, 95% of the time, you would not go into a formal default. It would be resolved some other way. And um, there are many established procedures for doing that. Um, so we looked at all that and, and New Silver helped us um, model all of that as well. And um, it's all very now very clearly documented in, in all of the maker documents. So anyway, that's just something maybe to add. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot, Phil, and welcome to the AMA. Um, so going back to this question that I just put through the chat. So the required finance per pool will be minted by Maker, by Maker Protocol and DAI will be made available. But then can it be minted at a limitless rate as and when requi required? And how, how is it decided how much finance shall be made available to fund? Yeah, so maybe I can uh, take uh, this one. Uh, it's not uh, minted uh, when we decide to, to fix the debt ceiling, for instance, from the silver at 5 million, but the uh, 5 million die are not minted yet. It's minted when uh, there is a need for it, because as soon as the new silver is minting for the die, uh, there is an interest rate and they need to pay the interest rate. Uh, but uh, they can use it uh, as much as they want. There is no limit per day or something like that. Uh, they are limited by the 5 millions and they need to bring collateral as uh, an NFT to get the die. So if they, are, if they have a good deal flow and they need to mint uh, 2 million uh, tomorrow, so be it and it's, uh, it's cool. And so on the second part, how is it decided when and how much? Uh, this is decide, decided by the MKR, the maker of governance, the MKR token of laws, and uh, there is a proposal made by, uh, by the reward finance credit, which in this case was 5 million. Uh, it's a start, and we can increase it in the near future as we want. Okay, very nice. Okay, so there's just a, a question that's just come through that I think seems quite an interesting two-part question. Since drop and tin are NFTs and, t and folks are going bananas over NFTs, understatement there, <laughs> is there any future plan plans to collateralize uh, real world assets of art? First, let's uh, jump on that first one and then I'll ask the rest of the question. Yeah, maybe I can jump on it and then Lucas feel free to add. So, I mean, um, yeah, so depends on what like art, NFT art or um, real world art. Um, 
I guess what's what's an interesting angle there. I mean, theoretically, um, Tin Lake could work with any types of NFTs. So um, the interesting part there is that um, it would be crypto native collateral and um, the legal question or like the um, the um, regulatory part that actually took us um, such a long time to combine this regulatory um, world with a trustless system that's like out of the question here so of course this is like a super interesting low and hanging fruit here but so far our focus just has really been like how to best bridge those two worlds in a in an efficient and scalable way but um, I mean we're we're looking we're flirting Nice. And, and the second half of that question is, zooming out to the far future, would you ever consider offering collateralized debt obligation with tranches to institutional players? If so, how would you envision this? Lucas? Several, adding more tranches comes up every once in a while, and I think it's um, definitely where, where this will go to. Uh, there's probably assets where it makes sense to add a mezzanine tranche. There's, uh, there's yeah, I think a lot we can do. Um, the reality is uh, doing this stuff in smart contracts is insanely hard. And uh, maybe to answer another question on, on the roadmap of uh, increasing tra transaction gas costs, um, something that would definitely make this all even harder. Uh, I mean, so what we're doing really is like we're running a we're basically running a credit fund on chain, right? Like this is all of these transactions are managed by like one set of smart contracts that do price calculation, interest interest rate uh, management, uh, default rate calculations, all, everything that is um, really part of what what traditionally would be like a like a credit fund in in the traditional financial world, and we're not quite there yet, I would say, with sort of adding adding more complexity onto it. So like our focus right now is really to build out um, the two trend structure we have. Um, and uh, to answer the transaction fee question, yeah, it's unfortunately just extremely expensive right now on Ethereum. It already costs more than 10 bucks just to send money. So we're, we're now in a system where uh, it's actually cheaper to send, almost cheaper to send a wire transfer uh, somewhere than like trying to send a near an ERC twenty token transfer. It's definitely when the network is congested, it will be cheaper. And obviously, that's not something that works. It's not something now. If you think of like doing lending transactions, that doesn't work either. And I mean, Sunny Futures approach here is to, um, in the long run, and how we imagine it, there will be um, a substrate based chain that is focused for, on asset originators creating these pools, and then as then sort of the uh, resulting tokens, the drop in tin tokens, could then be moved to wherever um, there is need for it. So they can be moved into Maker and into the Ethereum ecosystem. They could move on an L2 layer so investors could buy it uh, without having um, to be on L1 at all. Um, they could be moved into like another uh, DeFi ecosystem, say in Cosmos. Um, but for that to work, uh, there's a few, there, there's still a lot of work we're doing over the next couple of months. We need to work on having trustless bridges so that it's not really, it's still possible for a DAO like Maker to actually enforce these contracts and ensure, ensure like, okay, this is what it's supposed to be and not really trusting on uh, some sort of off-chain Oracle. There's other uh, kind of work that has to happen in that direction. So for now, the gas cost is something that we have to um, uh, look at as a, as a early adopter cost. Um, that I think a lot of people in this ecosystem are, of course, working on uh, addressing, um, not just for Sanifuge, but for, for crypto overall. Anything to add, Seb, Phil, Will? Or should we keep moving? Yeah, I'd love to hear what you think about um, mezzanine tranches and, and mortgage-backed security or, or, or CDOs. Um, yeah, so it depends what are be uh, uh, in the CDO because uh, it's a CDO that were the big problem in the subprime crisis because the CDO was just an amalgamation of mezzanine tranche of uh, RMBS or those that 
no one wanted. Uh, they put it together and they're making something that was uh, secure, but wasn't. And so just to point out that I think Maker will always invest in the most senior tranche. Uh, I don't think that we will invest in the mezzanine or in the junior one anyway. So at the end, it's more for other investors, but we are, but it might be interesting because for instance, we can provide capital, cheap capital for the senior tranche and then provide the opportunity to a centrifuge investor to invest in the mezzanine tranche a little bit more risky, a little bit more profitable, and but still less risky than the tin tranche currently, so they can get a, a better reward. But it depends. Yeah. yeah, just to complement on that from 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 Seb as well, I I, I agree. Um, I agree that uh, potentially at some further uh, like pretty far like in the future. That would be interesting, also from a uh, from from a point of view of maker to manage your portfolio, where it actually the most senior position has actually a very uh, a way more protected actually credit profile, which would potentially give the opportunity for maker to invest into some securities that currently uh, we may not have the, the risk appetite for, uh, but actually we would then. Uh, uh, that would be just too far to you have that risk of appetite uh, for a very senior tranche position. Cool. So we've just got a few minutes left. Um, and I want to move towards um, yeah, the, the subject of new asset originators. So there's a question with the potential for such a high debt ceiling. Will this mean more asset originators want to onboard? And what asset originators are onboarding right now? So Leah, if you want to start. Yeah, I can maybe give the centrifuge perspective and um, Will or Seb from the make perspective. So um, that's for sure. So we, with, if you look at New Silver, we're starting with a 5 million debt ceiling. That's if you look at the overall collateral of Maker with like 5 billion almost, it's like a tiny drop in the ocean. Um, we're definitely looking on one hand to scale the this pool, but then we have, currently six or more asset originators in the active governance process where we're already working with Seb and Will um, and Phil um, to um, where we're working on, on the risk assessment. And there is a really wide range. So um, we're working with um, asset originators um, that finance trade finance transactions. We have farmland um, revenue by space financing. So it is really a wide range. And um, es yeah, especially those higher debt ceilings are, are super interesting for, for those types of asset originators or like in general for any asset originator. And um, yeah, we're looking to scale this and together with Maker to bring more millions, eventually maybe trillions to, to Maker and overall DeFi. Um, have, happy to have you expand on this, Sep, or, or Will. Yeah, I can add that uh, our target for the end of the year, we will see if we can achieve it, but. Uh let's hope so, is to onboard the 300 million of uh, real world asset loans. So we have uh, currently 5 million. There is a lot of space uh, to be uh, to be completed. And uh, so, yeah, we are looking with uh, Lea and all the centrifuge teams to a lot of uh, potential investment and uh, more will come, will come uh, very soon. And the nice part is that um... We've said before that the onboarding for New Silver almost took two years overall, if you look at the larger picture, but um, the way Centrifuge is also set up or the way our infrastructure is built is also that we can reuse um, parts of that, like which will help us scale. And also the real world finance team has like formalized their process also a lot more so we can be a lot more efficient in onboarding new and more collateral types soon. Yeah, thanks Leah. Just a few minutes left. Um, there's a, a question in the chat, Lucas, which is 
I think we can make that quite clear. How do Centrifuge make money out of this? Are you charging a transaction or broker fee? Um, so Centrifuge is not charging a transaction or broker fee, um, but to, to explain that, I've mentioned earlier that we're building sort of a dedicated chain for the origination of these assets with the idea that then the resulting uh, pools and the shares in these pools can be moved to wherever uh, the, these assets are needed. Um, and this chain will be uh, run by a utility token that will be used to, uh, for stake, that is used for staking, actually it's already live, and is used to pay for transaction fees. And so the model um, is, of course, that as this ecosystem is growing, uh, more and more users will use uh, this. And that's sort of how, um, how we can build a sustainable ecosystem around around uh, these real world assets. Cool. Um, okay, so we're just, we've only got two minutes left um, and we, we do have a bunch of questions that came in from, from Twitter and from the forum, um, but there's been quite a lot of interest around understanding the, um, the kind of emphasis on real estate and the fix and flip um, and also how asset originators um, can begin this process and what is the onboarding process. So I feel like there's actually quite a lot of appetite for another AMA on this particular subject and we will organize that. Um, any last uh, yeah, comments from panelists? It's yeah, thank you so much, Seb, Will, Phil for joining us. And of course to Leah and Lucas from the Centrifuge team and to Helena who has been helping out with questions and on the tech side. Um, perhaps, Seb, just yeah, anything to just help us close out? Yeah, sure. I want to thank you for the opportunity, opportunity to present uh, this uh, new partnership. Well, it's an old partnership, but now it's concrete. There is an Ethereum transaction that shows that it works. And that's uh, very cool. And uh, yeah, the idea is really to increase the scale of this partnership uh, with time. And uh, I think it will be super important in the future. Thank you. And Leah, anything from you to close from our side? I guess it's the same. Um, yeah, it has been a really great process, lengthy but great process. Um, maybe just like quickly, I want to drop the link in here for those who want to get like a glance of the of the process for governance. I did like a short summary on it in our discourse. So, but then feel free to reach out either to us or to the real world finance core unit as well directly. I'm um, looking forward to hear from as many as possible. Great, so thanks everyone. And thanks to everyone in the audience. At one stage, we had around 40 panelists just because you can't see the numbers. So that's very nice. And um, thanks for all the questions. Yeah, Bye, thanks for everyone. Thanks.